<clears throat> what did the baby pig call his mother's brother? The baby pig. What did he call his mother's brother? What's that? Oinkle. Very good. Oinkle. What do you call a fake noodle? An impasta. Very well done. Very well done. I think you guys are getting ready for the exam because you seem really sharp. Uh, what is a frog's favorite kind of flower? A lily? It's actually a crocus. I, that's the joke. I don't actually really know, but okay. <laughs> it's not like we teach that in developmental biology. Okay. Any questions before we start? Don't worry, I haven't missed anything. Yep. Any questions before we start? So we're in part two of tissue healing, fibrosis, and repair. Okay. Is everybody getting the uh, YouTube lectures okay? Are they streaming all right? Okay. The audio sounds okay? Okay, good. Yeah, I, I updated with a different, a new microphone because I felt like this room was like super tinny in the beginning like it was hard you had to crank the volume all the way up for you could hear you might still have to crank the volume high but at least there's not a lot of extra feedback just remember to turn the volume down otherwise when you get an email that's super loud yeah question uh, there's a link on the syllabus on BB learner so if you go to the syllabus uh, you probably can type my name and then add like U NAU YouTube and you'll find me um, but it would just be easier to go straight to the syllabus, and there's a link up top, okay? So the reason I point that out is I think from a studying standpoint, next week, so we're in the immune section, immunology, which is our adaptive immune system. Um, <clears throat> it's not innate, and that'll kind of finish out um, our defense mechanisms, and we're going to capture that in exam one, all of the information that we've learned to date in exam one. Okay, exam one is going to be uh, on a Wednesday following President's Weekend. Now, the university is not closed on Monday, but we're not having formal class. Instead, we're going to have formal SI, and all of you are available because you normally have a lecture. So there's going to be any new material, so that should be our highest SI attendance. And, and I want to I emphasize this because um, this is a big deal. A lot of you have conflicts. Like you have other classes during SI session. Uh, a lot of you have part-time jobs, right? A lot of you are vigilantes and you save the world on your spare time. Because these students in this class always are like way overcommitted. And I get that. That's, it's never any different every semester. And that's why you guys do as well as you do. That's why I like teaching you guys because you're very motivated. Um, so this Monday for President's, or not this coming Monday, but the next one for President's Weekend, um, there shouldn't be any excuses, okay, unless there's some evil villain that you have to go um, reprimand. Uh, you should be able to be here for SI session, okay, and that's like the Monday before the exam. So I think that's going to be a good session for you guys to really get a sense of, okay, what do I need to be touching on at the very, very last minute, okay? Is that a good plug? <laughs> okay, we really believe in SI, we really do. And so after that first exam, if you come to me and you say, well, I didn't really do as well as I thought I would, what can I be doing? I'm gonna ask you how many SI sessions you've attended. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about, are you doing the readings? How are you doing on the pre-quizzes? Are you coming to lecture and you're hearing this information for the first time or are you actually studying as we go? At this point in the semester for exam one, None of what we've covered should be new material. It shouldn't, you shouldn't, you've already been studying. And we're just going to finish it out with the immune section, and that's the, that's the material you're going to have the least amount of time with. Because theoretically, you've had the most amount of time with everything that we've done. Okay? Exams, 50 questions, multiple guests. Um, there'll be images, histology or gross images on the screen. 
they will all be familiar from lecture. If they're histology, we will have covered them. There won't be some obscure histology out of the textbook. I mean, that's interesting to study, but I feel like it's, I sort of made a commitment back when I was in your seat. It really bugged me when faculty would say, everything in the semester is fair game, whether we've covered it or whether we have not covered it. And I thought that was not super fair. Uh, I really wanted faculty to teach me on what they taught me. Um, or, I mean, sorry, um, quiz me on what they've taught me. So if I, if I haven't covered it with you, it, it's not fair game in my mind. That was kind of a decision I made when I was sitting where you are, and that's the way I run things. I expose you to a lot of stuff. There's stuff that you read about that we don't cover in lecture. There's pre and post quiz questions that aren't part of lecture. So I cover a comprehensive amount, but when it comes to the exam, I really think it's most fair when it's a closed book environment. You know, I test you on how effective I've been at educating you, because that's my job, okay? So that's why I do what, the way I do it. Um, and it's closed book, so you know, now we kind of narrow down on what we're gonna focus on um, evaluating on. Any com uh, questions about the exam, what's coming? No, it's like a regular class, and we'll hand out uh, 1965 technology called a Scantron, and you guys will do the bubble form, so bring a number two pencil. Yeah. Okay. They are in color, yeah. yeah. They all should be in color. Yeah. They'll be on the screen. So they won't be like, a, you know, like a little thumbnail on your, you know, like where you have to have bust out a mag, uh, magnifying glass. I mean, they'll, they'll be like what you, essentially what you've seen on the screen. Anything else? I know the first exam is always really scary because you guys don't know what to expect. Okay. So that's why you should study, start studying now and talk with your major resource. Okay, let's segue into three phases of wound healing. We um, covered on Monday inflammation, proliferation, and maturation. There's a couple of other terminologies for it, as you can see here. We've got the inflammatory phase, which is synonymous with coagulation. And that means that there's a collection of blood in that traumatized tissue because there's fluid mostly blood that's leaking out, and it collects. And that's partly a result of um, exudates and tran transudates that are leaving. But part of that is blood that comes out. So this would be our coagulation phase that is synonymous with our inflammatory phase. And then we have the migration and proliferation phase where you've got these macrophages, first we have neutrophils, second we have macrophages. The macrophages release all these growth factors and cytokines that are signaling molecules. They're gonna signal to themselves to do something, that's autocrine. They're gonna signal to a nearby macrophage to do something, that's paracrine. Um, there may be certain molecules that enter the bloodstream and circulate systemically, and that would be what? Endocrine, very good. But let's assume that it's mostly autocrine and it's mostly uh, paracrine, autocrine and paracrine, and they're uh, not just signaling to other macrophages, but they're signaling to fibroblasts that are in the tissue. And those fibroblasts are now going to go through a proliferation phase through the cell cycle that we talked about, and then they're going to actually migrate. They're going to move. They're going to crawl. And we talked about integrin attachment, and they're going to grab with an integrin here and let go back here, and then grab here and let go back here and grab here. And what are they grabbing? What are they grabbing with the integrins? What's that? Other fibroblasts? Not typically. Yeah, so the fibroblasts don't necessarily like to, they'll butt up against another fibroblast, but they're not necessarily going to bind to each other. Okay. What are, they, what are they adhering to? What are the integrins attached to? The jungle gym. What's the jungle gym made out of? Cell matrix? Extracellular matrix. Extra meaning outside the cell. The ECM is the nomenclature. Extracellular matrix. What is it made of? Elastin and collagen. And what are those? 
What are they? They're fibrils. They're proteins, right? So the extracellular matrix is made up of protein that's specifically collagen, elastin, fibronectin. And where does the protein come from? Who makes the protein? The fibroblasts. They release their own matrix. Okay? Then we move into this remodeling phase as they're making more matrix. They're making the repair component that nearby cells will move into. All right. Coagulation, inflammation phase. This is breaching of the epidermis and vascular damage. That's what's happening. You can appreciate in the coagulation phase, we get a clot. And we get a clot as it leaks out of the vasculature and it allows for transmigration or diapedesis of these monocytes and neutrophils. Uh, first are the neutrophils and then we follow with macrophages. So just another textbook, actually this is a publication, a peer review publication, but just kind of giving you a sense of these different phases of wound healing. So our next phase, the migration proliferation phase. Now you see these fibroblasts are moving in. They're migrating in and they're replicating. You can see that the vasculature has been expanded. What caused the vasculature to expand? The macrophages, how? What growth factors? Just seeing how deep you guys in the back. VEGF is a perfect example. And expanding the vascular network, and another fancy name for that would be what? Angiogenesis. Very good. Why do we have angiogenesis? What does it do? What's that? Starts wound healing. I would argue that inflammation kind of triggers wound healing to start. But it's part of wound healing. So what does someone else, what, is, what does angiogenesis do for us? Why do we need it? What's that? Nutrients. I heard nutrients. It increases blood flow to bring nutrients in. What's an example of a nutrient that's important? Oxygen. Why is oxygen important? To help create ATP. You guys, you guys so this is how to study. This is, I'm just trying to help you guys study. It's like we're in a study session. I tend to be asking a lot more of the questions than you, but that's okay. Okay. All right, so you can see this is obviously um, published um, by a foreign lab because we're having, you know, this, is, this, is, this word actually is scar. Uh, and then we have a remodeling in our maturation phase, and depending upon how much fibrosis we have, you know, we may have something that is a healing response versus a regeneration response. Okay. Now, we get to some gnarly pictures, okay? So this, this, this could be, you can look away. They, they look, you know, I know you have the pictures, but when they're on the big screen, sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, that's a little too much. Okay, so this is a full thickness dermal wound because you can see the underlying muscularis. And the best treatment is to approximate the wound margin. And we've, we've drawn that where you bring these two edges together and you approximate the root wound margin um, and this would have a pretty favorable outcome because this, this isn't really jagged, okay? But there's going to be a fibrotic lesion there. There's no question about that. Well, sometimes in the case of full thickness dermal wounds, in the case of severe burns, there is not the opportunity to approximate tissue, okay? You can't, the tissue is compromised, so you can't bring anything together. So in the field, we have alternatives to things like third-degree burns or severe burns. And these alternatives, um, when it's not always an option, are in the category of autologous skin grafting. Okay, so I want to educate you on that. Autologous skin grafting means you're going to take skin tissue from that patient from one location, and you're going to transplant it to another location. So autologous, auto meaning self. Okay. Now, if the patient has 90% of their body that's been compromised with third degree burns, you're not going to have a lot of autologous skin available. Okay. Question? 
Yeah, it does. But what you can do is you can take a small piece and you sew it up in that location or you take a larger flap and you treat it with wound management because you know it'll regrow. And then you take that piece that you've harvested and you actually put it through like a tissue press and it squeezes it and makes it larger. And so you can take, say, a four by four inch square and make it, say, 12 by 12 by stretching it out. Okay? It becomes a covering. Yeah, you compromise the, the donor site for sure, but the donor site presumably is healthy, and so it'll heal relatively easily. Okay? Um, we also can move to cadaveric material. So cadaveric material, um, anybody an or, or organ donor? Any organ donors? Raise your hand, be proud. Um, I mean, organ donation is saving lots of lives, folks. Um, and if it's not saving lives, it's improving morbidity. That just means patients that are wrestling with major illnesses or diseases, okay? Um, cadaveric material for, I know there's a lot of dental hygiene and future dentists. Uh, some of you, you know, think that a lot of the stuff that we talk about isn't necessarily as relevant, but um, cadaveric bone is hugely used within oral maxillofacial surgery. I mean, bone is one of the most commonly transplanted cadaveric material, uh, demineralized bone allografts. Okay, so allografts meaning same species, and then we do have xeno, which means different species. That's usually porcine, which is pig, or bovine, which is cow. Okay. Now, you can appreciate in some cultures, in some groups of people, these are hands off. You're not allowed to do them. There's religious reasons. Okay? There's cultural reasons. So you need to be sensitive to that. Um, and then we have commercial dermal substitutes. And commercial dermal substitutes, uh, I got involved years ago, and this company, it doesn't exist anymore, we sold, we sold the parts out. Um, that was actually my last job there was to sell everything off. Um, but what we were working on, I'm a, a couple of different things we were working on, I'm going to focus on this dermograph, which is a tissue-cultured skin substitute. And the way that it worked uh, is we took a scaffolding that's like the jungle gym, we harvested fibroblasts, dermal fibroblasts from young patients. This is not embryonic stem cells. These are not stem cells whatsoever. They were fibroblasts. They were skin fibroblasts that came from infants that the skin was being thrown away as a biohazard. Any guesses as to where we got the skin off of an infant? Circumcision. Okay? So circumcised... These are boy fibroblasts. Um, circumcisions happen, and in, in this still is about one out of two in, in, in the world. Um, and America kind of pushes, the Western world kind of pushes the, the numbers up. So there's plenty of young throwaway skin available. So we took the um, leftover foreskin, extracted the fibroblasts out, and they're young enough that they're not immunogenic. So they're not rejected by the body, by a, by a recipient. We grew them in the, the scaffolding. They attached, okay, through integrins. They manufactured all of this matrix because these fibroblasts are spitting out this matrix, and they made all of these soluble growth factors. And after a couple of weeks in the bioreactors, we had a complete human tissue. So this product, Dermagraft, this is what it looked like or this is what it looks like. It's still on the market today. So it, we sold it, and it's, it's sold by um, a company called Organogenesis. So it's a three-dimensional skin substitute. It's an allograph, though. Here's the vicral scaffolding, and here's a fibroblast. And just to prove that they like to attach, this is its attachment points as it stretches out on this matrix, okay? Kind of grabbing on and taking residence. So... This was a clinical trial. It's probably hard to see, but this is in the mid-90s, so this is 1995. This is UCLA where we did this study, um, and these are diabetic foot ulcers. And so we've seen lots of ulcer pictures, okay? 
And so I thought this would be a relevant topic for us to look at how you can push healing. A diabetic foot ulcer is one that chronically won't heal. In fact, one of the inclusion criteria for the study was these patients had to have an ulcerated wound on their foot, somewhere on their foot, oftentimes it was on the bottom of the foot. It had to have been open for six months. Uh, right, I heard that, yeah. Uh, and these are uh, very painful. So this is at baseline. Uh, we put the patch on every week. Here it is one week later, three weeks later, five weeks, eight weeks, and by 10 weeks, it was totally healed. Okay, so 10 weeks, what's that? Approximately two and a half months. So it healed in, in two and a half months, and it had been open for at least six months prior. So um, a lot of the material that we'll put into wounds will do this type of, have this type of effect. This one was a little bit more aggressive in its healing capability because of all of the technology that we built into it. Uh, this is a laser Doppler study, um, which is giving an indication of blood flow. So to prove to you that angiogenesis is so important and that wounds won't heal if there's no blood perfusion, uh, let's take a look at these images. So this is uh, a week one, a week five, or sorry, one, three, and five. So in a different patient. But this is a, um, you can see, you can appreciate that the architecture of the wound is a little different, but it's still on the, the heel of the, of the foot. And we've circumscribed the wound margin. And you can see that the bright colors, like the reds and the yellows, are high blood flow. And the cool colors, like the blues and the greens, are low blood perfusion. And so at week one, in the middle of the wound, it's blue, and in some places it almost looks like dark blue. Very low perfusion. By three weeks, you're starting to see some evidence of perfusion into the wound bed itself. And by five weeks, uh, more than half of the wound margin has an increase in perfusion. And so we attributed that this was the reason that this technology was working. So we measured this in the laboratory. VEGF, which is appropriately mentioned back there, VEGF production uh, increases dramatically uh, in a 24 and then a 48 hour uh, time frame from these fibroblasts. These fibroblasts are also capable of making VEGF, not just the macrophages. And then this is a, another experiment where you can kind of appreciate the scaffold in the background here, the meshwork, but it had no cells, so it was the control and there was no new vessel elements that ran through there. With the dermograft, we have large vasculature networks that are moving into the new tissue, evidence of an angiogenic response. Okay, to finish out this section, again, these ones are even more graphic, so I just kind of want to warn you. This was a patient that came to us um, in the middle of uh, filing our regulatory submissions, and we were actually trying uh, to get approval and the patient was treated what we would call in an off-label fashion by the physician, uh, but it was a pretty dramatic um, uh, wound. So this was a chainsaw accident, and uh, the individual was cutting, and the chainsaw slipped, and it came up and hit him in the face. Uh, this is how he presented. Uh, the uh, approximation of the wound took place, uh, so they brought the wound margins together, uh, this was obviously treated with an antibiotic ointment. Um, the patient was put on systemic antibiotics. And then over time, just like what we did with the diabetic foot ulcer, uh, strips of the dermograft were placed um, on top of the wound. Okay? This is the patient a year later, okay? a year later after the initial injury. So what I want you guys to talk about right now between you know, your groups is, did we experience wound healing, or did we experience regeneration in this particular patient? So talk it over, and then be able to explain why. Why did you go with the answer that you chose?
All right, what are your thoughts? Okay. Okay, good. A combination of the two right up front. So regeneration as a result of, look at the hair follicles returned. I got to sneeze one second. <coughs> Excuse me. Gosh, that was like super loud. Apologize. Um, so regeneration, because we're looking at the hair follicles. Very good. I, so obviously there's some element of regeneration. Okay, uh, back here, someone else, someone else. Okay, we're in front. Oh, so the question is, what about, what about uh, sweat glands or glands that secrete um, sebum or oil? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I would... I would suggest that there is a lot of restoration of these um, exocrine glands because you see that the, the coloration of the skin or sort of the hydration level of the skin uh, looks consistent. It's not like it's dry and flaky where the wound is. And so that means that probably sebum is being released by sebaceous glands to create a, you know sort of a, a oily, um, covering over our skin. All of our skin has a little bit of oil over it uh, as a, a moisture barrier. I mean, it's a very effective moisture barrier. And you know, especially this time of the year, our skin gets really dry, especially if it's washed a lot. And so you wash it with a lot of, you know, detergents to, to clean it and take the oil off. And then what do we do? We go to our, you know, our bottle of sheep sebum and put it all over our, a lot of those, a lot of those, uh, um, uh, lotions and moisturizers are, are sebum from other animals. So we just replace it with, a, with another mammal's sebum, which is kind of weird to think about. But uh, yeah, it kind of grossed you out. Sorry about that. Uh, you can keep your own sebum, you know, or you could borrow your neighbor's, you know, just kind of take a swab from your neighbor. Uh, that's kind of weird. Yeah, that's an aloe graft if you take, never mind, bad, bad joke, bad joke. Yeah. See why my kids make the jokes? They're like, Dad, that was a bad joke. Okay. <laughs> Okay, what else? Anything else here? Any other comments about uh, our chainsaw patient? Yeah. Blood flow. So now we're talking, I love that. Now we're talking about blood flow. Well, um, the, the tissue looks very well perfused. It looks normally perfused. So we've got a vascular supply into the tissue um, that looks like it's appropriate. It's not like blanched white in certain areas. Pigmentation, anybody want to comment on pigmentation? Now, this individual doesn't have dark pigmented skin, but what do, you, what do you see? It's not pale, pale white where the scar is. It has similar pigmentation to the surrounding native tissue, which tells you what cell types are functional. Well, melanin is the protein made by melanocytes. Very good. Okay, you guys are remembering all this. That's awesome. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest there's, a, there's, a, there's regeneration that took place, okay? But there, is some there are some elements, I would agree, there are some elements of fibrotic scarring. And these tissues are really challenging because they move a lot, right? There's a lot of motion that takes place with the lips and facial muscles and things like that. So it's not surprising that, um, that there's some fibrotic scarring, but overall, I'd, I'd be pretty happy with this aesthetic outcome. Yes, comment uh, or question.
Yeah. Right here? Yeah. I would say the same with the scalp. A lot of people that have head injuries or ever have surgery on, on the cranium, you'll see definitively where, where, the, where the wound took place. Yeah, great comment. Okay. So probably a horrible test question <clears throat> is this regeneration, right, or repair, but a great study tool to get you thinking through what would I be looking for if I was trying to characterize one or the other? Okay, but probably not fair for me to put the picture up, even though we spent a lot of time on it, and say, which one is it? You know, you'd be like, uh, I don't, I don't think we. I thought we agreed that it was kind of a little bit of both, right? Yes. Yeah. So great question. So this is a year later, and it's a great comment, and and I want you guys to to hear that because I'm not sure I mentioned that. So wound healing in tissues, mostly in skin or especially in skin, it's about a 365-day remodeling phase. So if you have a wound that closes, you have the ability to influence that healing for a year. And then after which, you would consider it a fairly permanent scar. Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. So remodeling is, is, is about a year-long process. You can influence. You can influence the wound. Uh, let's say, for example, um, if you have a really gnarly wound and it closes, your um, your doctor is going to say, "Let's be very careful about going out in the sun." So I want you to either keep it covered, or I want to make sure that you put like 70 SPF on your scar because it's still changing, and we don't want to influence. And if you have ignored your physician. And she's told you to do that, and you said, whatever. Or he told you to do that, and you said, whatever. You'll notice if you get a sunburn, that scar looks really weird, OK? Uh, so about a year, uh, you've got to be really careful um, because you can influence it positively and negatively. Yes? Theoretically, yes. That's really all that they have the capability of doing. But so we're going to move into a different space here and and this is very relevant. I mean, so a lot of a lot of the field of medicine is companies or technology folks will develop technology and then they want to treat patients with it. So you have to get regulatory approval to do that. Well, the regulatory approval process is very expensive and it takes a lot of time. And and so you hear this sort of argument in America is why is healthcare so expensive? Well, in part, because of our system makes it so that you can't just bring a product to market quickly because you have to prove that it's safe and it's effective. Well, so the, the, the counterbalance to that is, what does it look like if there's no regulations? Well, we were there as a country back in the 1800s and the early 1900s, and there were a lot of products that were being sold that we're making claims about the cure for everything. And you hear about like bottles of tonic water being sold, telling people that it's the cure for cancer. Uh, so that's when the FDA evolved, is out of that phase. And there was one particular case in the United States um, where it was actually the Massengill uh, company, and they actually made antibiotics. And, and, and they had a salesperson that said, to <clears throat> senior leadership, I'll, I'll grab you in one second, uh, your question, and I have to finish the story. Um, hey, these antibiotics would be great for sick kids, but they taste horrible, so you should make it taste good. And so they got their chemists together, and um, they put it into an ethylene glycol solution, and it's very sweet. And so they were selling it to children that needed an antibiotic. Well, the ethylene glycol is a toxin. It's actually radiator fluid. And so if you guys know, old radiator fluid used to be sweet to taste, and it was a horrible toxin. And, and now radiator fluid, they changed the formulation. They've added a bitter agent so that animals won't accidentally drink it or drink it if somebody leaves it out. Um, but they lost um, quite a few kids 
as a result of that company's efforts. And so the, that's, that was what pushed uh, the legislation over to go into regulation. So it's always this balancing act within, you know, government where regulations are important to have. If they become too egregious, then it's very expensive to get products to market. Does that, does that make sense? Because why are drugs so expensive? This is ridiculous. Well, part of it's necessary, so it's safe. Because you want some sort of standard. You don't want just, you know, in a capitalist society, you don't want just the ability to put anything out on the market and you can't prove that it's safe and effective. So that's the language is it has to be safe and it has to be effective. So the scar cream, where I'm going with this. If you're marketing something that's topical, uh, the, a the FDA um, is a lot more relaxed because it's harder to do something harmful to somebody with a topical ointment. So all these scar creams, right, all these scar creams that are topical or, you know, um, moisturizers and things, they make very soft claims. Like, like it, 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 you know, you use this for 12 months and it may help to reduce the appearance of the scar. That's like the language they put on there. What does that mean? May help to reduce the appearance of the scar. <laughs> right? But you're not, you're not going to do anything unsafe to the patient. And so they kind of, so the vitamin industry is the same way. Supplements are the same way. Yeah. Okay, your question. What is, what's the six-month stipulation? Why would you not treat? Oh, oh, you're back to the clinical trial. So the way you design clinical trials is you say, we have a technology, we want to treat this um, problem, and we want, to, we want to recruit patients. Well, um, patients come from all sorts of different demographics different ethnicities, different ages, male versus female. Um, so you put in criteria on a clinical trial to say, we're only going to take patients that are between the age of 18 and 48, because we don't want to have to deal with geriatric patients because we know that age compromises things. So we're going to 18 because we don't want to be pediatric medicine. So we're only going to take eight, you know, patients between 18 and 48. Then they might say, well, we're only going to enroll females because we're using a estrogen birth control. Or they might say, you can't have a pre-existing heart condition because we're testing something and we want to see if there's any side effects to heart. So clinical trials are on purpose designed very narrow so that you can um, sort of normalize your population. So in that study, one of the inclusion criteria was we want to be treating a chronic diabetic foot ulcer. So you have to define what chronic means. So in that study, chronic was the ulcer had to be in place for six months. You can't have like a fresh wound that morning and say, look, I got like this ulcer this morning after breakfast because it would heal really easily. Does that make sense? So that's why the study was designed that way. Now that Dermagraft is approved, you can treat somebody right away. You could treat the person that stepped on a carpet tack, came into the wound clinic and said, I have diabetes. I stepped on a carpet tack. I know this is going to ulcerate. Can we treat it now? So you could do that now. But just as part of in a clinical trial, you actually have to very narrowly describe your patient population. That's part of the, the government rules. Yeah. No, that six months, it wasn't healing. That's correct. It was stuck in a chronic inflammatory state in that six month period. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most of those patients were getting treated. They were trying other treatments. They're not just sitting around waiting like, okay, four months. Whew, this really sucks. All's almost there. I mean, they're getting treated. <laughs> Stuff wasn't working. Yeah. We just had to have it documented by their healthcare professional that they actually had that wound for a six month period. That was the definition of chronic. Yeah. All right. Let's, um, <clears throat> let's, let's skip over. Uh, so now I want to move into wound repair 
um, in a topic that's really popular these days, and this is in the space of regenerative medicine. Okay, and this is the last little segment of this um, lecture series. Uh, and then we'll shift gears next week into immunology. <laughs> so this is another company that um, I do a lot of work with. And this company sources um, mesenchymal stem cells from amniotic tissue. So if you look at the placenta, which is like the afterbirth, that's another name for it, there's two main membranes. There's a chorionic membrane and an amniotic membrane. And in most U.S. births, that tissue is also discarded. So you can see a theme here. Keller likes to play with discarded human tissue. Well, I mean, there's a lot of really cool things in it. We shouldn't throw it away. So we take placenta. We isolate um, amnion, okay? And then from there, we liberate these mesenchymal stem cells. Now, they are technically considered adult-derived because you can't get the placenta until after the baby's born. Make sense? We do it from C-sections because C-section is a sterile procedure, which is a vaginal delivery, sometimes is compromised with bacteria. Um, we decellularize the membrane that makes a graft material. We take the cells, we put them in culture, and we grow these mesenchymal stem cells and they release all of these growth factors and cytokines that have a lot of healing properties. Healing properties are very similar to what they did in utero. Now they're doing in a manufacturing clean room. So now we have two products. We have a membrane, a tissue that we can use, and we have an injectable fluid. Okay? But this injectable fluid has no stem cells in it. It's acellular. And one of the reasons that we chose to do that was for the regulatory pathway. Because if you start injecting stem cells into patients, the FDA gets a lot more worried about what's, is something bad going to happen, okay? So here's the graft material. These are human dermal fibroblasts. That's what this nomenclature stands for. And these purple spheres are fibroblasts that have grown onto the scaffold after it's been put into a tissue, okay? And so it's just evidence to prove that, you know, after 12 hours of being present, it's such an encouraging environment for fibroblast migration um, that they'll start taking residence, migrating, proliferating, and you know by by halfway through the day. The fluid um, looks like this. It's uh, in a vial. We uh, were the first uh, company to release what we call an ambient fluid. So it's a room temperature fluid. What that means is is a lot of the other technologies in the space would actually cryopreserve it, um, you know, freeze it so it wouldn't degrade. Um, we developed intellectual property or patents um, to teach on how to make it stable just on the bench top, like at room temperature. So the nice thing about this from a clinic standpoint, um, you know, clinicians can store it in next to their gauze, their sutures. They don't have to have a, a specialty freezer. So the freezers are like laboratory grade minus 80 freezers that you'd have to store it in. And your freezer at home, you know, if you have like a deep freeze chest freezer, it goes down to probably about minus 20. So it's like four times as cold um, that, that a lot of companies will have to store it. But our ambient fluid um, is room temperature. So this is a little video sequence that I want to walk through. Um, so this is a mesenchymal stem cell that just divided. This is a time-lapse photograph of our manufacturing uh, process. And now you can see these two cells are starting to change. They're darkening, they're budding, they're releasing these vesicles, and they're dumping all these growth factors into the culture fluid. And if you watch, you'll, every now and then you'll see something like fly by the screen because they're actually pushing out these growth factors and cytokines that influence the wound healing process. That's the whole concept. So now they're really like ramped up. They're doing all sorts of things. They're you know getting jiggy with all of their vesicle activity where they're dumping all of these growth factors and cytokines into the fluid environment. And all we do is we collect that fluid. So because we know about this wound healing process, we know if I can collect all of those secreted products that come from these really young stem cells, I don't need the stem cells anymore. We can deliver just those growth factors and cytokines, and they will have activity around the fibroblasts that are in the surrounding area 
to encourage migration and proliferation. They'll act on the endothelial cells to cause budding and angiogenesis, right? If you put it into bone, they'll trigger the osteoblast uh, to lay down new bone, okay? Um, so we've got all sorts of different growth factors and cytokines that are found in that fluid. Uh, epidermal growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factor beta. The take-home message of this slide is this is a slide with a sort of cocktail of growth factors that are made by these mesenchymal stem cells that encourage the cell to proliferate, to differentiate, to grow, and lay down new matrix. All of those words should make sense to you because you know that every single one of these results is critically important in wound healing. We talked about skin, so skin's important, but I'm going to show you in some slides here in the future um, on some clinical cases, it acts in other tissue beds, just evidence that wound healing happens pretty much the same in every tissue. And if it's complete regeneration, you don't have any scarring or fibrosis. If it's not, you get a fibrotic scar. So we have assays in the lab to say, okay, well, prove it. Prove that you've got activity of these growth factors, especially if you're leaving them on the bench top. But, um, and then I'll get to your question, uh, you guys know that proteins can be stable at room temperature. You know that you can formulate proteins in a solution so that they don't spoil or denature or change their architecture sitting at room temperature. How many of you have a uh, nut butter in your pantry? Peanut butter, almond butter, right, Nutella. Do you have to refrigerate it? No. And it's a lot of protein in there, and it stays totally stable, and it doesn't go rancid, meaning it doesn't spoil, it doesn't denature, because it's being preserved, right? So that's the concept is how do you stabilize these? But the regulatory body wants to know, the FDA wants to know, you got to prove it. So here is metabolic activity um, on fibroblasts. So we took dermal fibroblasts with groom and culture in their normal culture media, and you can see kind of their um, optical density value, which gives you an indication of metabolic activity. And we have a two-fold increase, which is statistically significant when you spike that culture with this growth factor product. Okay. You can see this is a 14-day uh, um, rodent study where we created a wound, like I showed you on Monday, and then we treated the wound with um, a graft material, and then we injected it with the growth factor soup. This one is the control wound after 14 days. And what I want you to be able to see and appreciate is there's not a stratum corneum on top. It's absent. Over here, in 14 days in this mouse study, we have a completely new epidermis that's regenerated. So we're accelerated wound healing uh, as a result of using these two combo therapies. Max, you had a question? Yeah, so EGF's role is cell growth and differentiation. Platelet-derived growth factor is cell proliferation. And then TGF-beta actually stimulates a lot of matrix production. Also has a role on stimulating um, cell proliferation. Yeah, there's like 80 to 120 different compounds in it. Yeah, that's a good question. So how long can you grow the cells? Um, we've grown the cells out to about passage four or five, meaning we let them divide into four or five populations. And then what happens when they're in the Petri dish is they start to differentiate. They change. So they no longer stay as stem cells. They become fibroblast-like or they have neuronal projections or... So... <clears throat> Well, so you use, special, you use special media that they grow in to prevent them from differentiating, but the key is you just don't grow them very long. So we stop after passage four. So we go P4, P5, they look fine. You go out to like P7 or P8, and they start to change. So you just do it until you know they're staying as stem cells and they're maintaining their uh, pluripotent capability. So as a pluripotent cell, they're making all of these growth factors because 
they're kind of preparing for what they're supposed to be doing. And then eventually after time, they're like, we're getting nothing, I'm, like, I'm getting nothing here. So I'm gonna turn into something else. This is, get, you know, they're kind of ADD in a way. Okay. All right, here's another assay. The, the, so this first assay was fibroblasts, okay? These are chondrocytes. Where do you find chondrocytes? Cartilage, they make the cartilage, okay? So look at chondrocyte activity. So this is what chondrocytes look like in culture. And similar experiment at 72 hours and then 144 hours. And chondrocytes have their own growth media. Uh, this is their DNA activity after 72 hours. We see a 20% increase in chondrocyte activity after just 40 or 72 hours. And that difference is maintained out when you double the time to 144. So it has activity on fibroblasts for skin. It has activity on chondrocytes for cartilage. Where would you find cartilage? Ear, ear yeah. So if you feel like tear off your ear, you can inject. Uh, where else could you treat? Uh, some areas of bone, for sure. Anything else? Think about old people like me. What do we always complain about hurts? My, my, my back. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Knees, right? Joints, back. Okay, shoulders. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not that old, dude. All right, on this next slide, uh, synovial sites. Where do you find synovial sites? You never heard of a synovial site? Have you ever heard of synovial fluid? Has synovial joint? Okay, oh wait, now, right. Now we're talking. Point to a synovial joint. Okay. Right? Shoulders, knees, and toes, right? Not head. I don't think we have any synovial joints in our head. What is this one? This is a, what is this one? Axis and atlas? What is it? Yeah, what's the joint? It's not synovial. What is it? Someone look that up. Someone Google that. Google that stuff. Okay, synovial sites. So one of the questions that we had is, all right, if we're doing knee injections with these fluids, which is a lot of what's happening in the industry, um, what's happening to the cartilage? Can we induce cartilage repair? Uh, well, it kind of suggests from the last slide I just showed you that there is an effect on chondrocytes, and they're the ones that make more cartilage. So if you increase their metabolism, increase their DNA activity, and metabolism goes up, they're going to be making more cartilage. Right? The other cells that are in these synovial joints that make up the lubricant fluid, which is the synovial fluid, are synovial sites. So same thing. We looked at what about DNA activity, and we see a 27.5% increase when you treat with this regenerative fluid. And after 96 hours, it's almost a 60% increase over the control. So we've got synovial joints where we've got chondrocytes, and synovial sites, not fibroblasts, but these growth factor cocktail solutions are causing a regenerative potential within these joints. Now we do this assay on um, blood vessel formation, and hopefully I've convinced you that blood vessels are critically important for healing, whether it's skin, whether it's a synovial joint, whether it's bone. So we know that there are potent, there's our VEGF, we know that there's VEGF, another molecule known as angiopoietin-2, and one called fibroblast growth factor beta. And these stimulate branching of the vascular tree, or new blood vessel formation known as angiogenesis. And just to mention it, this MMP9, this is a matrix metalloprotease. And so what it does is it helps to break down um, the extracellular matrix. And you, and, and you might ask, well, why would that be a good thing? Why would you break down the so? When you have to sprout a blood vessel, you actually need to remodel the matrix so you create a track for the vessel to migrate through. Does that make sense? So if you have a vessel here and it's sitting within a matrix and you want to go this way, you actually need to create a track through the matrix so that you can create branching to occur and you create a pathway. So the matrix metalloproteases are very important for remodeling. Remodeling of a wound means that you break down kind of the old early tissue that was laid down and you change the architecture to be more favorable. Okay. 
enzyme. So these enzymes are critically important in wound healing because they create that potential. So this is an angiogenesis assay, which is kind of cool. All these assays are done in the lab. Um, these are endothelial cells. So now we've looked at fibroblasts, we've looked at chondrocytes, we've looked at synovial sites, and now I'm showing you endothelial cells. Where do you find endothelial cells? In your skin? If you have blood vessels, so where do you find endothelial cells? They line the blood vessel, right? So they're the inner lining, the tunica intima of the blood vessel. So if we grow endothelial cells in culture, they spontaneously form tubes. That's what they like to do. They're programmed to create a tube, like a blood vessel. So if we, bless you, if we grow blood vessel, or I'm sorry, endothelial cells in culture, they're going to link up in these tube formations, and they fo form like these architectures of a vascular bed, which are meshwork. And they'll have intersection points, which are nodes. And so you can characterize the number of nodes and the number of meshes as an indication of the degree of angiogenesis. Does that make sense? So you can see up here nodes and down here meshes, and we've got three different results. The green bar is our regenerative fluid, and you can see that it's the highest, like a two-fold increase and a four-fold increase. So more angiogenesis is happening in the presence of this regenerative fluid. Um, over the negative control, which is just the culture media. Now, what's the positive control? The positive control bar is VEGF in, it alone was spiked into the solution. And so the regenerative fluid is above and beyond what VEGF will do all by itself. And so this is evidence that the growth factor environment or the cocktail of growth factors is really important versus just isolating one particular protein at a time and saying, ah, that one will work. Because when it's all together, it actually has a more robust response than any one of them all by themselves. Question? It's in there. Yeah, VEGF is in there. Um, if you look back at this slide, it's in there, but you've got other ones as well. And so we picked a positive control because the literature is very, very rampant on the role of VEGF as an angiogenic growth factor. So simply by demonstrating that we're above and beyond what VEGF does by itself is, is, is rather convincing. Okay. Um, these are these matrix metalloproteinases again that I was telling you about. So we look at um, matrix metalloproteinases that allow for that remodeling effect to take place. Well, equally important is you don't want to digest away all of the matrix. You don't want to just randomly chew away all the matrix that you lay down. So you have a regulator, and these are inhibitors. So these are tissue inhibitors of the metalloproteinases. So it's kind of like the balancing act that takes place. So in a wound remodeling event, we've got angiogenic growth factors that are there in all of us, right? They're stimulating new blood vessel growth. We've got agents like platelet-derived growth factor and transforming growth factor beta that cause fibroblasts to proliferate and migrate. We've got matrix metalloproteinases that digest away the tissue so that you can get your blood vessels through. And then we have regulators like TIMPS 1, 2, 3, and 4. So TIMP stands for tissue inhibitor metalloproteinase, and one, two, three, four. If scientists aren't overly creative, so TIMP1 was the first one that was discovered, and then some genius spent all their brain cells finding out a second one. So when the newspaper said, what are you calling this? They said, TIMP2. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Let's call it that. So TIMP1234, um, this is a paper that illustrates the importance of these TIMPs. So let me walk you through this. This is a left ventricle, okay, in a rat. And this is wild type, so it's healthy, normal. And this is the control left ventricle in the black area. This is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium. The black area in the middle is the void space, the inside chamber of the ventricle in the atrium. And when we infarct these animals, meaning they have a heart attack, 
you get a dilation. So there's a larger area of black, which is indic indicative of a larger space of the left ventricle. Does that make sense? So normal, healthy mouse has a heart attack, then the left ventricle swells. Okay? If you take a knockout animal for TIMP1, which is an inhibitor of metalloprotease, so it's preventing the breakdown of matrix, but it is negative for those alleles. It's a knockout organism. It's a mutant. This inside area is the size of the left ventricle and left atrium, which you'll notice is larger than the control. No infarct. The only thing that's different is this guy has a genetic defect and doesn't make TIMP. If you give them an infarct, look at how much bigger the dilation takes place, simply because TIMP is not there. Okay, So I was just trying to underscore the importance of these inhibitor proteins, because you want to remodel the matrix, but you don't want to just obliterate the whole matrix. You'll, just, you'll have like mush. Okay. All right, then the last thing that we've characterized in these fluids, um, myeloperoxidase. So this is a scanning electron micrograph. This little arrowhead is pointing to a uh, ectosome that is this vesicle that buds out and spits out its content. And it spits out, this neutrophil spits out myeloperoxidase. So the neutrophils that we recruit to the wound bed, they're the first responders, correct? They have the ability to spit out myeloperoxidase. What does myeloperoxidase do? Well, here's a, here's a bacterium, okay? And myeloperoxidase is this, like, what do you, like, star-looking structure that's not green? I don't know what this is. Okay, it looks like a fuzzball. Well, <clears throat> it binds to the bacterium. And what it does is it stimulates opsonization of that bacteria so that it can be seen by phagocytic cells. So opsonization is a term that means it prepares it or signals this bacteria to be phagocytosed. Another molecule that you'll find interesting is this green star, which is C3B. What is C3B? See, is R2D2's cousin? When did we see C3B? When did we see that molecule? It's in the complement family. What did complement do? It's labeled complement because scientists are super creative. Why did they call it complement? What is it complementing? Coagulation. Not coagulation, but you're getting closer. Inflammation. Inflammation. Very good. Complement C3B, look back at your notes, <clears throat> helps to complement the inflammatory response. Look at where it binds. It binds right next to myeloperoxidase. So this bacterium has no chance. It has been signaled by C3B and myeloperoxidase for phagocytosis by a macrophage. Okay? Is it kind of tying all together a little bit? All right. There is not a complement that does anything for viruses, no. But, okay, <clears throat> looking at anti-inflammatory activities of these fluids. So we've got our family of interleukins, like interleukin-10, and then we've got a receptor agonist, interleukin-1RA. Um, what do these guys do? This will become more apparent next week, okay? So this is a little bit of a foreshadowing slide. Some of it's relevant to today, so let's talk about the today stuff. Here's that macrophage symbol. Do you guys remember when I drew that macrophage symbol? And you guys are like, I don't believe them. But this is the symbol for a macrophage, and that's what this cell is right here. So IL-10 has activities on the macrophages, okay? And these macrophages are the inflammatory cytokines that will um, um, help to um, um, stimulate an inflammatory pathway. And... <clears throat> We'll take a look at dendritic cells and uh, B cells next week and nat natural killer cells. But by blocking this pathway um, with these activities of interleukin 
receptor ag uh, agonist, um, an uh, antagonist, we can actually lower the inflammatory burden. But in inflammation, or in, sorry, in wound healing, do you want to completely knock out all inflammation? No. What if you drop it down a notch so that it doesn't become chronic, but it still is able to trigger future events of wound healing like neutrophil infusion, macrophage infusion, right? Angiogenesis, granulation tissue, wound resolution, and wound repair, okay? So what we're seeing clinically is there is some anti-inflammatory activity, but not to the same extent as doing a steroidal injection. So a lot of patients have like um, inflammation of the joints. They have bad knees or bad backs. And we've been pumping them full of corticosteroid injections. And there's a three to four month period of time where they feel better, and then it just stops working. Well, the reason for that is you've just knocked out all inflammation. So yeah, the pain goes away, but there's no healing. And the tissue is actually worse, worse off. Whereas here, you can actually block the activation of macrophages and dendritic cells, but not completely eliminate it like you do with corticosteroid therapy. All right, the last few slides are very clinical. Um, and um, we'll walk through them uh, just so that you can have a frame of reference of what we're seeing out in the field. So this is a patient that was a 47-year-old female. She broke her ankle. Um, they did a repair. Uh, a year later, this is what it looked like. Okay, so this is a chronic wound. You guys agree? It's looked like that for about a year. Pretty bad. There's appliances in there because they had to treat, they had to treat the, um, the broken ankle. So August of 18, uh, this is a releasing incision that was cut up top so that they could approximate. That's hard to approximate. You guys agree? So if you cut the tissue up top, it releases the tension. You can bring the flap together. That's what we did in September. And we packed it full of membrane and fluid. Here it is just a few days later. Um, here it is in October. And then we're getting down here in January of, of 19. So from August to January. Um, and then this little scab, the uh, foot and ankle surgeons decided to remove it uh, to encourage um, more blood flow and to completely close the wound itself. Okay, it had been open here for a year, and it was closed here in in, in about a year, totally. Okay. Uh, look at orthopedic uh, indications. This is a 39-year-old male, and what I want you to be able to see here is on the right um, uh, fibula, we've got a fracture. I think, yep, there it is. So you can see on the inset. It's a little easier to see this little spiral fracture. They stepped in a pothole um, out on a field and twisted the ankle and it broke. Uh, so this is at baseline and this is 30 days later. So how many of you have broken a bone? When did you break that bone? Because most of you aren't 39. In your teens? Let's say you broke a bone in your teens or your 20s. How long did it take you to heal? How long were you in your cast? Four weeks? You guys don't remember? Six to eight weeks, right? How long were you in your cast? Four months. Four months. Okay. That must have been a serious fracture. Yeah. Okay. So lack of blood flow. So typical casting for a bone of a teenage to 20-year-old is going to be six to eight weeks. So let's take eight weeks. This middle-aged, arguably, almost 40, healed in 30 days, no fracture whatsoever. So all of that activity of healing that we looked at is relevant, not just in skin, but it's happening in bone, right? So skin wound healing on this slide, bone wound healing on this slide. This slide is just to prove to you that the elements of bone wound healing from these literature sources that aren't in your textbook are virtually identical to what we covered in skin wound healing. So I just want you guys to understand, we talked a lot about skin wound healing, a lot of specific examples, because I have a lot of, you know, like firsthand experience with it. But what we're learning applies if this is a liver laceration, a kidney laceration, okay, cardiac, or bone. 
Very, very similar profile. Look, inflammation starts it off, then you've got repair, and then you've got remodeling. Okay? So just a couple of summary slides of where these products are being used. And this isn't the only company example. This is just the one that I'm affiliated with. There's a lot of other companies that are doing this out in the field. But you can see all the, oops, sorry, all the different places that these technologies are being used. So they're being used in ankle injection, spine, shoulder. Knee is a big one. Soft tissue would be um, uh, skin, uh, and, and so on and so forth. This is, I think, folks, really kind of the future of the types of therapies that you all are going to be working with as healthcare providers. You're going to be leveraging, and this is stem cell science. We're not treating with stem cells, but we're taking the stem cells, we're extracting them out, we're asking them to do certain things, we're studying them, and then we're leveraging their capability to influence wound healing. Okay? And you can only do that if you understand how wound healing works. Does that make sense? You've got to understand the phases before you can start designing therapeutics to use. And hopefully as future healthcare professionals, having some of that understanding of how it works will make better choices about how to treat for your patients. Okay? All right, have a great week. See you guys next week for our immune section.